Perhaps not. But Malcolm says that only English schools produce English gentlemen. Of course. And only English schools produce a modern scholar. His Excellency, the Lord Howis. Thank you. Not at all, not at all. How good of you to come. I'm sure it will be a pleasure as always. Now, where's the guest of honor? Hmm? Douglas. Lord Harris, may I present my son Douglas? Douglas, I'd like you to meet Lord Harris, the finest governor Bombay's ever had. And what's that you're wearing? It's my father's shirt. It's a Harlequin cap. You wear it when you play cricket. How well, do you now? And do you know what it means? It means that, that you've played cricket for Oxford, sir. Yes, yes, that's quite right. But it means more than that. It means that you're a, a member of the most honoured class in England. It means that you're a leading player in the Empire's greatest game. Did you have one, sir? Were you a cricketer? I've played the odd social game. Lord Harris is teasing you, Douglas. Not only did he captain England, he introduced cricket into India. Well, one had to civilise the place somehow. Do you want a harlequin cap for yourself one day? Yes, sir. That's the spirit. There now. Happy birthday. Don't stand on ceremony. Go ahead and open it. Go on. Open it. Happy birthday to you. Thank you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Douglas. Oh, very good. Very good very shot, good. Master Douglas, sir. <laughs> That's the bat you gave him in Bombay. <laughs> Good Lord. <laughs> Afternoon, Percy. Uh, my respects, my lord. Uh, respect is not that young man's long suit. Strangely dressed. Is it just affectation? No, oh, no, no, I don't think so. No, most people consider the captain of Surrey to be quite mad. Just thank God he didn't bring his damn banjo. Oh! oh. oh. They're just changing over. <laughs> Winchester's made a great start. Their captain's a very fine batsman. First man in, last man out. Now it's Eaton's turn to bat. He's moving too far down his wicket. I'll warn him. Don't do that. Run him out. But it's customary to give a warning. I'm not on the village green now. Run him out. They should have warned the batsman by showing him the ball before they ran him out. Mrs. Jardine, you'll have to speak to David. Can't have that sort of thing. Douglas, you remember Lord Harris? Well done. And, of course, you've heard of Plum Warner, former captain of England, and now well-known as the Prime Minister of Cricket. It's a great honour. 
A great day for Winchester. Congratulations. Uh, very convincing win. Thank you, my lord. A pity about that run-out. The bowler should have warned him. I agree with Plum. I think the conventions of the game are just as important as the rule. If I'd been captain today... You'd have lost the match. Ah, Mr. Fender. <laughs> May I introduce my son? Douglas, this is Mr. Fender, captain of Surrey. How do you do? Well done. Fine batting, good fielding and a daring tactic. You don't think it was wrong? <laughs> not at all. I was Eaton's number one bat. If you're in town, give me a call. They may not play that way at Middlesex, but we certainly do at Surrey. I like this night. Mrs. Jardine? Mr. Fender. I must run. You should know, Douglas, in spite of what Mr. Fender says, your father and I have never played that way. For some of us, cricket is more than just a game. I wouldn't know. I didn't see it. You can take me a moment to settle in. That's what Fender said. a new fast bowler. Congratulations, Arthur. See? You said you'd win. Two pounds? You said I'd be out for a duck. Two pounds. Thank you. And a pound for every Larwood wicket. Five? Yep. Well done, Harold. Fastest bowler in England. In the world. What do I owe you, Harold? Seven and six, Skipper. Yeah. Have a pound. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Very brisk. Thanks, Mr. Jardine. Not much past the trot today, though. But you can bowl faster. Oh, I. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's wait until we're on the same team. Mm. Cheers. 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 Ah. Ah. <laughs> My father always used to say, if you're looking for a decent, fast bowler, Go down the nearest coal mine. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's to Larwood. Ah, Jardine, where's that son of yours? He's, uh, there. <laughs> ah, oh, he's turned into a fine young man. A fine batsman, too. <laughs> oh, now look, I don't think I'm talking out of turn. But there's a feeling at law about time he had a run for his country. That would be a great honor. The captain. Three cheers for the captain. Give him. Give him. Give him. There must be nothing quite like it. Victory. To strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. And so, after an absence of almost six months, the English team came home. It was a glorious morning, late in spring, and what a welcome they got. For they were the victors, defeating Australia four tests to one, retaining the ashes, and proving yet again that in cricket, as in most things, England reigned supreme. Congratulations, Douglas. You've acquitted yourself admirably. Thank you, my lord. Come and tell me all the details of these centuries of yours. I'm so glad. Oh, I need these. Well, today would evoke a thousand memories for Plum Warner. Hello. Oh, delightful to see you. Hello, dear Plum. Oh, dear lady. 
<laughs> ah, congratulations, my no. dear fellow. Splendid tour. First-rate batting average. Your parents must be very proud. Thank you. <laughs> Mrs. Jardine. Uh, Percy George oh, no, has just been telling me about young Bradman. Hello, oh, yes, he's quite remarkable. Really? That's not what Percy was saying. I think I'm about to be misquoted. Excuse me. I've spent weeks trying to persuade him, but he still can't see the truth. And what truth is that, Douglas? Well, like most batsmen, I can play one or perhaps two shots to any given ball, whereas Bradman can choose between four or five. Oh, he doesn't choose. He just plays the first shot that comes into his head. But he has no technique. Now, he can get away with this on those true, hard Australian pitches, but put him on one of our green strips, with Morris seaming the ball late, Oh, no, it's too unorthodox. i uh, take the third test in Melbourne. Oh, uh, not that again. Now, it's a very good example, Douglas. Now, on at least three occasions, the ball was short-pitched, screaming out to be hooked. He played a cover drive. Oh, it's absurd. <laughs> no, it's not absurd. At least two of those balls went for four. That's the power of Brett. He's learned that a batsman's sole objective is to score runs. And he'll play whatever shot, unorthodox or not, which best fulfills that purpose. It makes it almost impossible to set a field to him. Well, I'm sorry, old chap, but I think you're on your own. Well, the skipper agrees with Percy and says Bradman's just a flash in the pan. And Tate says that he'll have to play a straighter bat if he comes here and plays on one of our wet wickets. Exactly. They're older men steeped in the conventional methods of play. Oh, thank you very much. Bradman is something totally new. He's not interested in playing classic shots. He's never had any formal training, so he's developed his own style, a unique approach. I believe if he continues to develop, we could see scores none of us have ever dreamed of. He could rewrite the record books. <laughs> he could change the very nature of the game. No, oh, come, come, Douglas. That's being unnecessarily alarmist. No batsman in the world has ever done that. I must say, in fairness, there are hundreds of thousands of Australians who'd agree with Douglas. Out there, he's become quite a celebrity. It's not a very pleasant sight, Bradman standing in the middle of the pitch, bat raised, the crowd chanting his name. As a society, they seem to crave heroes. Well, I like Australians. I mean, it's just that they prize individualism. Oh, indeed, they continually want to elevate one man at the expense of the team. I find it quite abhorrent. Well, it's certainly not the nature of the game. The heart is the team. I'm afraid the Australians wouldn't agree with you there, my lord. Their whole approach to cricket is different. And at times, I wondered if we were playing the same game I'd grown up with. To listen to the crowd, you'd think it was a, a hunt with the English as the fox. No, you were used to that. It's just good-natured barracking. Well, questioning a man's parentage is hardly good natured. <laughs> <laughs> My dear fellow, in Australia, bastard is almost a term of endearment. Well, I come from a different world, thank God. The Australians are not a people I'll ever warm to. Nothing wrong with that. Always easier to give a hiding to a man you dislike. May I interrupt? I really do feel like a cricketing widow over there. Haven't you finished talking about the game yet? Not quite. Mr. Fender and I have something to discuss. Do we, my lord? Yes. What's that? Journalism. Ah, do I detect a note of indifference bordering on aversion, my lord? Now, don't start that banter with me. I found your reporting, your criticisms of Chapman, most distasteful. Now, doesn't matter what your opinion of him is, he is the English skipper. He deserves your respect. It ill behoves you as a county captain and a man who's represented England to, to disparage his tactics publicly. It was an honest opinion. It was my job to report it. I am not talking about reporting. I am talking about loyalty. That is all I ask of a man. Not from a journalist, perhaps, but from a cricketer and a gentleman. Do you understand? Oh, I understand. But I don't agree. Oh, well, I'm not staying here to argue with you. I've made my point. But make no mistake. These things do not go unnoticed. I never believed they did. Well, then, why must you always be giving offence? Why must you be the tear away? Why all this affectation? Not affectation, my lord. It's me nature. I suppose I could be a little more diplomatic. But I've always thought diplomacy a blood brother to hypocrisy. Honesty is one of the things I like about Percy George Fender. He may not be perfect, but at least I can live with him. Oh. 
Well, what was all that about? Oh, nothing much. My attitude, behavior, personality. That's all. Why? In two minds, Percy doesn't know whether he hit you for a four or a six. made of me. He put every ball exactly where he wanted, where it would cause me the most humiliation. Oh, don't worry, Percy. We've forgotten in a month. He's going to destroy every bowler in the land. As I said, he's unique, a phenomenon. Oh, nobody said we weren't warm. Oh, well done, dear. <laughs> it's going to be a bleak summer. It will indeed. England's only hope is to think broadly, develop a new strategy, one aimed solely at curbing Bretman. <laughs> you think so? I think our only hope is prayer. At least God is an Englishman. Or has that changed too? Day after day, new records fell before Bradman's bat. The youngest batsman to score 2,000 runs in a season, the fastest century in test history, the fastest double century ever, the highest score ever made in a test. It was history in the making. And on and on it went, this 21-year-old boy from Bowden, driving the English crowds to delight, the journalists to hyperbole, and the cricketing lords to despair. Might as well throw stones at the Rock of Gibraltar. Perhaps you want to change the rules, make a little bugger better for handicap. All we can do is pray for rain. Couldn't he be asked to use a smaller bat? Today in Manchester. Well, little wonder, unemployment nearly 20%. I was thinking rather more of Bradman. Oh. Oh. oh, yes, he's a problem too. Problem? <laughs> you might just as well take up tennis. Oh, come on now. You know the British never surrender even when their backs are to the wall. You were Secretary of War. Where's your fight? Oh, I've got plenty of fight. But the only way I can see to get Bradman out is to send in a couple of battalions. <laughs> well, according to young Jardine, the infantry is useful, but wars are won by generals. What England must have is a clear strategy. Go on. That's the sort of thinking we need. Well, he says, if you can't bowl Bradman out, you must think him out. He has his idea of designing an entire team to exploit Bradman's weakness. What weakness? Oh, well, that's what it calls power. 
Jardine's rather like a physicist talking about the atom. He's never actually seen it, but he's absolutely certain it exists. Well, now, just don't dismiss it. If your physicist had done that, the atom would never have been discovered. I'm going to see young Jardine. It's just a theory, really. I saw him in the last test at the Oval. It was a damp wicket, fading light. Larwood got up a lot of pace. The ball was rising sharply. Redmond started to look uncomfortable. Well, what batsman wouldn't? But every time he has faced Larwood, he's hit him all over the field. Yes. Well, you were right about one thing. You always said that he had changed the whole nature of the game. Now we have to find a whole new approach. That's the challenge. Who is there can meet it? Well, England has some fine skippers. Oh, oh. Chapman, Wyatt, they had their chances this summer. Inadequate. Yesterday's men playing yesterday's game. Uh, you know, you have many fine qualities yourself, Douglas, both as a man and as a cricketer, qualities that could be useful to England. As, as long as you had never been captain of a county team, it's um, rather difficult for you to be considered. Yes, I know that, my lord. Uh, has Fender ever indicated to you uh, how long he might remain as captain of Surrey? No, my lord, we've never discussed it. Would he stand down in your favor? I don't know, I'd never ask him. He's my greatest friend. Not even it meant a chance of being captain of England? No, not even then. I'm sorry. Oh, don't be. No, don't, don't be. No. I admire loyalty. So, what did Lord Almighty Harris want? He's been talking to Warner. He wanted to hear my thoughts on Bradman. What did you tell him? No, nothing new. But is that all? Well, he congratulated me on my foresight. Then he rattled on about India, his childhood. I think he's lonely. Well, I'm not surprised, given his personality. I'll wait in the car. Uh, shall be a minute? Good evening. Oh, good evening, my lord. I... Yes. Yes, that will be possible. No, 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 no trouble. Well, tomorrow morning at 11. Good night. I'm quite sure that you don't want to spend any longer with me than you have to, so I'll come straight to the point. If you would, my lord. Regardless of how good a cricketer you might be, I think we both realize that you will never captain England. Do we? Why is that? Because I say so, that's why. If I might be permitted an observation, my lord, you are no longer young. No. No. But I am sure that the Almighty would be just as distressed as me to see you as captain. I am quite confident he'll leave me here for as long as I am needed. And is that the purpose of this meeting? For you to inform me of your divine mission. I asked you here to talk about Jardine. He's a contender. Very strong contender. Of course, he would first have to become a county captain. I believe Nottinghamshire is looking for someone. I was thinking of somewhere closer to home. Have you spoken to Douglas about this? Yes. He refused to raise it with you. He has shown great loyalty. And what do you say? 
You speak of God. But you give me the devil's alternative. Good day. Where the hell have you been? My apologies. Thought you'd forgotten. I'm sorry. We're about to go. Don't <laughs> worry. The table was booked for eight. I'm sure they will have held it. Douglas, before we go, I'd like to have a chat, if you don't mind. And a drink. <sighs> well, I have spent the day in St. James Park. Thinking. And the upshot of it is, I've decided to step down at Surrey. Why? Oh, there comes a time when a man must think about his life, his achievements, his successes, and he must be realistic. I have sadly neglected the wine business of late. And the truth is, my best cricket is behind me. That's rubbish. You've been speaking to Lord Harris. I ran into him. What did he say? He rattled on about India, his childhood. I think he's lonely. Do it, Douglas. No, I can't. Not like this. Forget about the circumstances. If I can't, then nothing would please me more than to see you have it. Take it as a gift. A gift to a dear, loyal friend. That night, Douglas became captain of Surrey. Within months, he was to achieve his game's greatest accolade. He would be named captain of England. In his campaign to regain the ashes, Douglas's weapon would be Harold Larwood, his plan, body line. The captain. The captain. The captain. So you believe that pace bowling is the solution to our Bradman problem? Yes, sir, I do. Mm. What does Plum think of your intentions? Ah, uh, well, he thinks I'm wrong. Yes, well, of course, he has been considering the evidence. Bradman has been dismissed more often by spin than by pace. It's an aberration. Pace has never been used consistently as part of an overall strategy. Well, well tell me all about your strategy. That would be premature, but I do have particular requirements. Bradman is an unorthodox batsman. We must employ unorthodox tactics. Do you want me to talk to the selectors? Well, only should it become necessary. I merely wanted to inform you of the state of play. You learn quickly, Douglas. There are more games won off the field than on it. Telephone. Yes. What might be important? Might be. Don't bother. I'll get it. Fender. Oh, yes, he is. Oh, I see. Yes, yes, I'll tell him. Goodbye. 
Well, it's Lord Harris's butler. Been hunting you all over town. Wants to see you immediately. Well, can't it wait till the morning? Ah, but the thing is, he may not be around in the morning. That's from our very first test in India. Do you remember India, Douglas? Indeed I do, my lord. Remember your first cricket bat? Very well. And who gave it to me? <laughs> and I remember a small boy in Bombay who told me his greatest ambition was to wear the Harlequin cap. I watched him grow. I watched him learn the game of empire. I noted with pride his captaincy of Winchester. And when he was chosen to play for his country, no one was happier for you than I. Then, when you were ready, I saw to it that you became captain of England. I recognized in you something that nobody else could see. I saw a man imbued with the courage of his convictions. A man who used justice when possible. Severity. <laughs> Severity, when necessary. <coughs> Douglas, you know and I know that the time for severity is now. It'll bring England back to her rightful place of supremacy and the ashes back where they belong. Now, you can do it. You are a man of vision. God knows there are too few of us left, but Douglas, don't falter. Don't let the selectors or the lords or anyone else obscure that vision. There are men who will oppose you, but they are weak men, mean men. They are frightened of your power. Now, be hard, be audacious. To assure you, <laughs> Get out, get out. <coughs> Shall I call the doctor? Ah. <laughs> that old leech keeper waiting for me to die, but well, I won't give him the satisfaction. Not until you brought me back the act. The night Lord Harris lost his struggle for life, I lost Douglas. Before he entered that room, he was a man with a vision. When he came out, he was imbued with a sense of destiny. There was no stopping him.